you know, at the end of the day, one of the re main reasons that I d wrote this book is because having my children alongside me um, while my mom had dementia was the best gift that I had to help, help me cope with it. Mm -hmm. And I think a huge gift for my mom. And if you can help your kids feel more comfortable, then they're more likely to form connections with your loved one and stay connected and stay involved and want to read and want to visit them. And that's really why a book can help and, or any other way of talking to them about it. Welcome to the All's Authors Podcast. We're so glad you found us. I'm Marianne Shuko, a registered nurse, author, and dementia daughter. Join me each week to listen to one of our 200 plus authors talk about their dementia journey, sharing intimate details and painfully obtained knowledge to help others currently on that path. We hope these stories offer you comfort and support as we strive to break the silence and stigma surrounding a dementia diagnosis. May one of our authors speak to your experience. Content presented on the following podcast is for information purposes only. Views and opinions expressed during this podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent views of the Whole Care Network. Always consult your physician for medical and fitness advice, and always consult your attorney for legal advice. And thank you for listening to the Whole Care Network. Today's guest is Katherine Harrison, who is not only an ALS author, but our creative director and a member of our management team. Katherine was compelled to write and illustrate her award-winning children's book, Weeds in Nana's Garden, following her mother's passing from frontotemporal dementia in 2010. During her family's journey with this disease, Catherine noticed how much involving her two young children in caregiving added value to the experience. So she decided to create an engaging picture book that could reach many children, enhance their understanding of dementia, and perhaps encourage them to connect more with those on this journey. The enchanting illustrations in Catherine's beautiful book enhance the poignancy of the loving story. What's more, Catherine has collaborated with dementia care expert Jacqueline Gannett to launch another book for children about dementia called I Smile for Grandpa. Well, hi, Catherine. Welcome to the Al's Authors Podcast, Untangling Alzheimer's and Dementia. Hi, Marianne. So nice to be here and talking to you today. Yes, we always love to talk, don't we? <laughs> I have to do a disclaimer and um, just state that Catherine is one of my friends, co-founders, and directors for Owls Authors. Yay! Yay! She's our, <laughs> she's our Canadian member. That's right. We're international because of me, right? Uh, yes, and, and a few other people that are in the, in the organization as well. But we will talk about that another, on another day. Yes. So, um, obviously, you've written a book about Alzheimer's. It's a children's book. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience as a caregiver and what led you to write that book? Sure. So um, it has now been, believe it or not, uh, almost 10 years since my wow. mom last actually passed away from um, her dementia. So it's going back a long time, but it was uh, a long time to create the book following my mom's passing. So she was diagnosed um, with early onset dementia when she was 62. And it was coinciding with the birth of my second child. Oh, so boy. yeah, it was a bit of a strange start to my motherhood with my second kid, because we knew that something was changing with my mom. Yes. Um, and as I think is normal among many people in this world of um, Alzheimer's and dementia, it took us I don't know, probably almost two years to get some kind of firm diagnosis of what was going on. And even then, it wasn't a full diagnosis of her dementia. It seemed to have elements of frontal temporal degeneration, but um, there was no concrete um, 
decision on what she had until actually after she passed away and we had an autopsy on, oh. on her. Yeah. And what did that reveal? Uh, it revealed that she had um, what is called ambiguous, non-genetic vor- form of frontal temporal de- generation. Wow. <laughs> so what, what motivated you to do the autopsy? Because that was optional, right? Yes. Um, it was because we ha- she had no Alzheimer's disease in her family, on her family's history. And it was such a fast progression. So she was diagnosed in, ni- in when she was 62 and she passed when she was 67. Wow. So it was a five-year... That was fast. Yeah. It was so fast that it didn't seem to have all the markers of Alzheimer's disease. Um, so it was actually my dad who was the real big advocate for um, having an autopsy because he felt that we should know whether this was something genetic or something that we could expect for all the rest of our family. So he was very much an advocate for finding out what happened and what was going on with my mom. Okay. It sounds like a wise decision. It was, it was, um, I think it helped us confirm what we had already had already suspected uh, because she wasn't showing some of the traditional signs of Alzheimer's disease because it was, was so quick. It, we were starting to think that she had frontal temporal degeneration, but because the diagnosis process took so long, by the time they did the brain scans to do a diagnosis, there was so much brain degeneration, they couldn't confirm from a brain scan if it was Alzheimer's or PICS or some other form. Yeah. So it opened us up the world of there are different types of dementia. And, you know, when we went into this, we didn't know much about it, but we came out knowing that there's this whole spectrum of different uh, types of dementia diseases that can affect your loved ones. Yes. Yes. That's very important. A lot of people don't understand Alzheimer's is just one type of dementia and dementia is the umbrella term for many, many different types of dementia caused by different things. Mm -hmm. So it is important to get an accurate diagnosis. I think that there is more emphasis now on that than there was even 15 years ago when this was happening. Yeah. I remember tools. Yeah. And I remember one of my healthcare practitioners saying, Oh, it doesn't matter what kind of dementia she has. And I now know that that is so false. Um, True. Because it could really help you better understand what's going on. That's true. And it gives you, a, you know, um, some sort of guidance as to which pathways that you can take that some may have better outcomes than others. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. you're not floundering. <laughs> right, exactly. As so many people do <laughs> flounder. <laughs> they don't know what to do. Yeah, so I, I would suggest anybody to, to see if they can get more firm information about what kind of dementia it is, if it's possible, because I think it would have been helpful. Yeah. yeah, and even after the fact, just for your family's knowledge. Exactly. You know, exactly. to find out if it is genetic or not. Some right. people don't want to know that, but it's certainly helpful in decision making. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So tell us about your beautiful book. <laughs> so I wrote a book because I had this interesting um juxtaposition of little kids growing up as my mom progressed through dementia. I was very much, and I was a part, I have to say, I was a part-time caregiver. My dad was my mom's full-time caregiver, but I lived um, the closest of my, of my parents' children. I lived the closest, so I was there frequently. And I came often with my younger, my young kids in tow because uh, they were always with me when they're little. Mm-hmm. And yeah. so um, they were they were experiencing my mom's dementia as well. And so I looked to see, oh, there must be some books we can read about this. And at the time, there was very, very few books. Like there was like a handful of books um, that even mentioned Alzheimer's disease for children. And so that was a, an, an obvious gap um, identified for me and my family. And so when we progressed through this disease, um, I always had to talk to my kids about what was going on. And it was actually my, so my mom was this amazing gardener and she had this beautiful garden. It was one of her joys. And as she progressed through the disease, 
the garden would get untended as you would mm -hmm. expect. So the flowers still came up, but nobody was looking after the garden anymore. Um, but my little kid, my children, they're like five and seven. They don't care. They just still like to go into this garden. In fact, having big, tall weeds are kind of fun because you can mm -hmm. hide. And so they would still go and they would pick flowers. And my mom liked to do that with them too. And it was large garden. And so it was my daughter one day after we had been in the garden with my mom, who we were arranging the flowers. And my daughter talked about how the garden was changing and how it was like, kind of more crazy and there was less flowers that was her sort of like there's less flowers than there used to be and it was like a cue for me that to talk about how my mom was changing again and an opportunity to talk about how because I always mm -hmm. felt like it was really important for them to know that she had a disease okay. because yeah otherwise she was kind of she could be scary and sometimes she got mad and upset when then other adults wouldn't get mad or upset and sometimes she did things that seemed strange, like she would sing when other, you know, in public places or um, would just get really emotional and, and do things that my kids thought was weird to them for an adult, fine, but just mm -hmm. not unusual for an adult. So we talked a lot about mom and it was when my daughter mentioned the flowers that I said, yes, yeah, she has this disease. Um, at the time, we called it Alzheimer's because we didn't know, and it was easier to use the more common <laughs> vernacular. Yeah. And my daughter's like, oh, like the weeds in the garden. Her brain is is affected like the weeds in the garden. She can't find her thoughts. She can't find her memories. I was like, yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yes. That's a great mind. analogy. <laughs> it was a great analogy. So insightful. <laughs> she, so it was that struck me and you know knowing there, there wasn't any books that I could find for my kids and my daughter's insightful um, analogy I thought okay I'm gonna make this book so I made weeds in Nana's garden I started uh, you know the rough idea when mom was pa alive but once she passed I focused on creating it Wow and you did all the illustrations and the text and it's available in a hardcover, a paperback, Kindle and, version, a digital, yeah. right? And yeah. how many languages? Uh, currently French, German, Portuguese, and English. Next month, Danish, then oh my Swedish. Goodness. That's beautiful. Yeah. So that and was... Sorry. What's the name of the book again? <laughs> <It's called. laughs> I don't think we said that. <laughs> Weeds in Nana's Garden. Weeds in Nana's Garden. It's an apt yeah. title. It is. And it was a long explanation. Sorry. <laughs> oh, that's, that's great. And how have readers responded to the book? Well, you just talked about the languages and mm -hmm. I mean, that's been the most unbelievable response is people all over the world who feel that this book could benefit um, children in their countries saying, I'll translate it for you. And we need this book in our country. So that's been, um, I think the most powerful response for this book. Yeah, that's fabulous. And what would you say to people who might say, well, children don't really need to know about this? I'd say that if, as anyone who has been in this journey can tell you, it's very difficult to exclude people in the family. Everyone is impacted by it because it's a long progression and it affects you in so many different ways. So children will know that something's happening they'll sense that there's something different going on and if you don't talk to them about it they people can be kind of scary like i already said that you can be sort of scared as a child if you don't know what's going on and um so by talking to them about the disease it makes it less scary you can ensure them it's nothing they've done to make someone upset mm -hmm. that has dementia because yeah, they know that's it's, important. it's a disease and also ensure them that they won't, it's not a contagious disease like the cold or a flu. So they don't have to worry about connecting with someone with this disease. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, one of the re main reasons that I d wrote this book is because having my children alongside me um, while my mom had dementia was the best gift that I had to help help me cope with it mm -hmm. and I think a huge gift for my mom and if you can help your kids feel more comfortable then they're more likely to form connections with your loved one 
and stay connected and stay involved and want to read and want to visit them. And that's really why a book can help and or any other way of talking to them about it. So they stay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I can see that where well, that would be really helpful if you were um, a mother or parent in a situation where you had to bring your children with you mm -hmm. when you went to visit or care for your other parent, your parent with dementia and it would open up a whole new host of logistical problems if you your children wouldn't weren't willing to go or kicked up a fuss so you couldn't leave them behind. Yes. So exactly. that's another way of looking at it is to prepare them so that they can they'd be willing to participate when you have to. Yeah, and enjoy it and gain from it. Right. And they can actually give back to your loved one. Um, and I, I mean, once my mom moved into a care home, there's no question that they were so welcomed at the care homes. Yes. Uh, and the other residents loved having them around. They do. <laughs> it's like a ray of sunshine. Yes. And children, it's just, you know, their hope. Yes, exactly. They're so alive. They have energy. They bring so much color and energy into the setting. And some yeah. of the um, some of the care workers at the home we were at were so it's so embracing my children and would help them, uh, you know, learn how to use my mom's mechanical bed so that my son <laughs> would, you know, help her use it. And and, uh, and they would teach them how to use the wheelchair and the, so they could help them adjust the wheelchair and um, that kind of thing. And often my kids would join whatever activity, like what they you know, some often there is people giving classes or, and it was just a, 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 it actually like was such a relief for me too to have this enjoyable thing happening while I'm yeah. at the care home. Yeah. Yeah. That's a bonus. It was a huge bonus. <laughs> that's a huge bonus. Yeah. So you mentioned um, your mom, she was in assisted living was, what other experiences have you had with like the home care, assisted living? Was she in long-term care? How did that go? Yeah. So we had uh, multiple kind of, as I think most people have in multiple stages where we had my dad as a primary caregiver. And then we had, um, we have a whole system in Canada with uh, care support and you get assessed based on what the diagnosis is of the person. And then you might get certain care workers come to your home. And we had a bit of that. Mm -hmm. And then we also had part-time caregivers for a while while my mom was still at home to relieve my dad and help my dad. Um, so he didn't get burnout. And then eventually it was really my mom's physical abilities that, um, made it really hard for her to stay at home. So she could no longer go up the stairs and we had an old two story century home and we couldn't really enlist even with like a chair, a wheelchair ramp up the stairs. Mom would just couldn't even tolerate that. Like she was using a walker, but was very unsure on her feet. And so for a while we thought about setting her up um, downstairs and, um, and, but that didn't seem to work well either. So it it was just really that she needed so much care and movement that it made sense to put her to have her um, move into a care home. And um, so she actually was in two different care homes because initially she was on the waiting list for one, and so we um, had her in one, and then she moved to another one that had a bigger room for her. Um, my experience was very positive. It, like we were really hesitant to put her in a care home, <laughs> even like my phone, my choice of words, put her in a care home, mm. <sighs> but it wasn't like that. Like it, it felt like that when we made the decision, but yes. when we, when she was in the care home, we were like, it's so much better for her. Um, so much more care and so much more patience and so many more people that have so much more resources. And we had, you know, a, uh, an occupational therapist that could help her with things. We had people that were helping with so many different things, the people that knew what she needed that were monitoring her physical needs. Um, by then she had started to really change physically, couldn't really walk, needed some occupational therapy, like lots of 
her hands were starting to tense up and having some people that were experts in managing that like was a relief for her. It was a relief for my dad. Um, and they were very loving and positive nurturing home that we had. So we hesitated. And then once she moved in, she just seemed happier, less stressed. Um, she didn't have, I almost felt like she was more relaxed because there was less, uh, I don't know, st stress uh, from my ma my dad and I about having to manage her in an environment where she couldn't really manage very well. There was lots of steps mm -hmm. in our house. There was small doorways. Um, and then all of a sudden we were in a place that was open and airy and bright and all hours of the night people were there to help her. So if she was up at 2 a.m., there was someone there to be with her. And yeah, so. Yeah, it does sound like it's a relief. Yeah. And when we came, like my dad ate breakfast and dinner with her every day. But when he came there, he was relaxed, I think, too. And so he was relaxed. She was relaxed because the, every all her needs were being attended to and he could just focus on spending quality time with her. Yeah. Well, that's, I like to hear that story. Sometimes yeah. you hear a lot of negative stories and, and I know my, I had both my mom and her husband in, in different care homes and his experience because he was so, you know, in stage dementia, he got, good care it was really not much you could do for him but with my mom it wasn't like that at all she she was still you know mentally intact right. and her needs were not being met nearly as well as they were at home but mm. you know she got to the point where she required two people to move her and we didn't have two people 24 right. 7 so right. Right. yeah so that ended up being the breaking point for that I think everybody at one point reaches that breaking point where well, it's the physical thing that you can't yeah. deal with the physical needs yeah and the like, sleeplessness and of the sleepless. you know being up all night yeah. she was up all night and then the caregiver would be up all night right. and right. then you know the caregiver would be up all day because they had other things to <laughs> exactly. do and she might sleep all day so and then that would get into that whole cycle with the days and the nights mixed up we went through all that so yeah um that's, I wanted to ask you, though, um, being in Canada, is the assisted living, is that something that is covered or is that private pay out of your own pocket? Uh, it's private pay. And okay. certain, there are certain homes that are private pay and there are certain homes that are government homes. Um, okay. And the care quality is different. Mm -hmm. So you might look for a home that you can subsidize it for. Um, they're partially, some of it's partially subsidized. So I believe the costs are less than fully private. Um, what we did have care, what we did have supplied for us is we had a certain number of um, visitors, like what was the, called the Victoria Order of Nurses would come and visit. And that was kind of part of it. And there's a whole um, assessment process for what level of care you get under our healthcare system. And it's not perfect by any means. Um, no. Especially in the dementia world where if she's, once she's determined to be hospice care, then a whole new level of mm -hmm. care gets to you. But it, as you know, dementia can take many, many years. Yes. So it's, it's a system that supports us better than some healthcare systems, but it, 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 it doesn't support as much as... <laughs> Good. And I know that our, we don't have, we have Alzheimer's Society of Canada, not the Alzheimer's Association, but that's some of the things that they're working to advocate at a government level is what kind of support the healthcare system can provide us. Yeah, well, that's um, important. So, and I would say to anyone who's in Canada that you would probably best to, to go to your Alzheimer's Society because even this was 10 years ago now, like the system's going to be possibly different so to go and they would be experts on what you can um get and what kind of thing might right. be covered. yeah yeah and it's important to get that information ahead of the game because if you wait until a crisis hits or you're in the middle of it and you need it and then that narrows yeah. your choices exactly so it's good to know what you know, what's available to you in the event of this or that or something else so that if that happens, you're prepared. 
Yes. In fact, I know um, one of the first things I would do if someone told me they had a loved one with a dementia diagnosis is to say, contact your local Alzheimer's Society and find out what kind of services you can get to help you with this yeah. um, in terms of support groups and for both your loved one and for you as a caregiver. Um, and yeah, and all, they would also have more information about other um, other care services that you can have. That's I very think, good advice. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't think to do that. Um, no, I think people, they, they just find themselves <laughs> spinning their wheels that they don't you know, no, take the time to reach out for help. It's like one more thing I have to do. I don't have time. Right. But and even then, if they had somebody do that for them. Um, it might be helpful because I know here in New York where I am, they have care managers that you can consult with that will help you, you know, develop a care plan and get in touch with different agencies and people that might be able to help. Right. And I know that, yeah, that even finding these kind of care managers would the, the also your local Alzheimer's society would direct you to where to find that those people and there's a whole system it depends if you go into hospital there's a a different system to manage that care than if you didn't go into hospital and it's constantly changing so right yeah to be on top of it yeah and then your loved ones needs constantly change and the families as well (sighs) yes don't they (laughs) you need to keep that in mind i know we always used to we we would have like in retrospect, like we were so slow sometimes in no- noticing things. Like I just still remember for one, one particular thing was my mom's clothing. Like it took me, it was sort of an aha moment before I stopped um, buying her regular clothes and started to buy clothes that had like easier fasteners. And, yes. But it, yeah, it, it was just like, oh, Jeez. Yeah, it makes life easier. It makes life easier. And you go through this struggle for a long time before you're like, why am I trying to put these pants on like this? Like, um, And you realize there's all these other options that you're... Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, if you have other people. And I mean, that's why reading books about yes. it and other people's experiences I think will maybe and there's more and more books t- today than there were five years ago ten years yes. ago this and we find them you. we can find them yeah. this will help you know okay right I remember that so and so when they yeah. started to do this first and you can be a bit ahead of it yeah. yes get ahead experience <laughs> is the best teacher exactly so to learn from others who are on the same path or have watched the same path and people are very willing to share their knowledge as well. You know, they don't want to they have that feeling that, that they want it to all have been for nothing. Right. You know, exactly. and it's over. And to say, well, I learned all this stuff. Now what can I do with it? And yeah. teach, teach others. So. Exactly. Um, so what do you wish you knew at the beginning of your dementia journey that you didn't find out until later? Um, I think... It took me, it actually took my children to make me realize how looking at what was lost all the time was a bad (laughs) idea. Mm -hmm. And to not to measure progression from, oh, she can't do this anymore and doesn't do this anymore. And, but to, to look at what you are currently doing to live in the moment and just to, to accept the current um, situation and in, and embrace what was happening at the time and and live in that acceptance space not to judge not to look at what's changed but just today we're going for a walk in the garden T- today we're singing Christmas carols mm-hmm. today we're eating um, something that she didn't want to eat yesterday um, yeah to not look at the progression in uh, what is lost, but to look at what is happening right now and enjoying right, right now. Living in the moment. And yeah. that's a hard thing to do. A lot of people can't do that, especially, really, you know, modern society. You are always worried about what's going to happen next or dwelling on what happened in the past exactly. and not on the here and now. And some people have even suggested that these dementia diseases are here to force us 
to learn how to live in the present. That's one of the big lessons that people get. It definitely did that to me. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, yeah. And, and I, and my children are good. Children are good at that, right? They don't judge um, the way things used to be. So they, along with my mom, were a very good teacher to me to stop and smell the flowers. I know it's cliche, but yeah. it's, it's, I think that was one of the most important things. Um, and that to enjoy that time together and stop worrying about what's happening behind you. Just try and focus on what you're experiencing now. Yeah. As much yeah. as you can. <laughs> so what was the most difficult task that you faced as a caregiver other than having to um, place your mother out of the home? Um to not be emotional all the time about it. I don't know. Um, really, a, it's an emotional ride. And as I say, I, I was centered well with my children who love to live in the moment. And I'm an emotional person. And to be able to not get emotional while you're experiencing this change in your loved one because you're not very effective when you're emotional um, in a, in a overwhelming way. And um, I rediscovered art through the journey because that was a way that would, that I've always dealt with emotion. Um, and I started to do much more art as a means. I actually started doing art with my mom and my kids. And then I realized that it was helping me. And so I actually went and did more art and I went back to art school and did a lot of art. And that was my coping because I needed some emotional outlay. Um, and that's partly why I was able to illustrate my book because yes. I had done um, all this art. So it was a big, a big movement. Uh, yeah. Because you can get so emotional and when you're emotional and they sent your, your loved one senses your emotions and it's just a train wreck. That's right. That's what happens a lot of times is that they may not understand what's going on, but they understand your body language, your tone of voice, the feelings, if there's tension, they pick right up on it. Exactly. And, and that changes their reaction. Yeah. yeah. So that those are important struggle. skills to learn. So your art was one of your self-care activities. What, yeah. what else? What else was there that you did to keep yourself whole? Um. I think I had the luxury of having little children to mm -hmm. focus on. So that was it. The, the other big thing, the kids. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And did you have the support of other family members? You said you had siblings. Yeah, but um, it was good in, in some ways because they lived far away, which can often be challenging, but I, it was a good relationship that we had because they were the objective people that would come and, and from my sister lives in Los Angeles. My brother at the time lived in England and they were my sounding board and they were far enough away to be really, really objective about what was happening and help give us support that way. I felt like they, it was a good combination of them coming to help us. We, it was the first time we did, I remember like group conference calls and stuff like mm -hmm. that way back when we would have those quite a bit. Um, the hardest thing was them um, keeping on top of like whether dad, my dad was doing okay. Like it, it was hard to know because we weren't there every single day, how d dad was doing. Um, and uh yeah, that that would have been better if I had been slightly closer so I could feel what dad, but we coped through it. Um, we had a few times like where dad was, my dad had um, a stroke. He had, um, it wasn't a full stroke, um, an IA, is that what it's called? Um, a TIA. TIA. He had a TIA. Mm -hmm. Um and it, that was, it sounds, so I don't mean to dismiss it at all. It was, but it was a wake up call that he was under a lot more stress than all of us thought he was under. And so it was after that, that we got even, we got more part-time care to help him. Mm -hmm. So because I was in a different city, I was an hour away. And because my siblings were in other countries, it was harder for us to be on top of what my 
my dad was going through. Yeah, I could see that. How is your dad now? He's doing very well. He has, he actually had a bit of a romantic story. Oh boy. Um, so while he was looking after my mom, he noticed a newspaper article from a woman uh, talking about her husband who had frontal temporal degeneration, who he just happened to know from his university. Mm-hmm. So this woman was writing about a man that he uh, went to school with. And so he reached out to her and she lived in Ottawa, which is about four hours away from where my father lived. And they got together because they were both caring for a spouse and uh, they formed a really strong, strong friendship and helped each other through it. And both of their spouses have passed and they have now married and they mm. are now living in a new, new life together from their shared experience. of That's uh, such a beautiful story. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there is hope and there is life after Alzheimer's. That's I think right. people don't, when they're going through that experience, they, they don't see that, but that is a, a true testament to that. And also the story of so many of our authors in, in our organization who have survived it and have gone on to have a new life or to at least um, manage to put that in the past. Right. And I'm, and the bravery of all of these authors and yes. my dad and for reaching out and moving, um, showing vulnerability. Like I, I, uh, you know, realize how it would, would have been so difficult for them to to bond over that on one hand, but it was so healing for both of them to have have each other to talk to and form yeah. this new relationship with. And the same goes for reading the books and for people writing the books is sharing this vulnerability. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's scary too. Some people have said that, pushing that publish button was the most frightening thing they've ever done. Exposing their story, their vulnerability to the world. But it's such a gift for for those that receive it. It's true. It was, I found that it was um, more scary for me to create it. Like it was the creation that was really emotional for me. Mm -hmm. And I had like moments where I was like teary all over my paintings. I was crying. Um, just in remembering the experience but it's cathartic too it is it's very cathartic exactly a lot of people said they were healed when they you know sat down and went through all the old papers or the journals and brought out old memories that they thought were laid to rest and it's true try to make sense of it all because when you're in the midst of it you don't have time for that you're just going go go and actually something that i did more recently than um is I my mom was really into coloring books and I went through my dad gave me all the coloring books and she literally filled like dozens of coloring books like from edge of page to edge of page of every page and then I went through those and I uh, made a big collage of them and that was cathartic too because I know that during during her dementia those coloring books were her creative outlet um and just I couldn't look at them before like because they were almost painful but in looking at them now they were um a part of who she was during that journey and when I looked at them again you know they're very thoughtfully created in in that some of them are scratched some of them are colored together like there's stuff going on that she's expressing in those colorings and that's important to Mm -hmm. me to recognize and I I'm excited to be able to show this and we have it up that collage up in our house that that was what what was that was her with dementia but it was still this really interesting creative expression of herself yeah that's that's lovely uh let's say I had one more question for you what do you wish people who have not encountered dementia in their lives knew about the disease I think we started a little bit on this about how there are multiple forms of dementia. Mm-hmm. And so that knowing that there isn't just one size fits all and that how complex a disease it is or a group of diseases um, that one person 
person's experience will be totally different from someone else's experience. So knowing that, be open and accepting to what is happening because there isn't, it is not predictable. It's very complicated. Um, and it, but it is a disease that is affecting people's brains and they're not intentionally doing it. Um, so be yeah. open and accepting. Yeah. I think that to add to that, um, other than, you know, the biological, physiological, psychological factors in this disease process is the other factors that people bring into it, like their socioeconomics, mm. their marital status, um, where they live, you know, whether or not they have children, if the children are involved. And I mean, money is yeah. huge, a factor. huge factor. And, you know, if they have health care. So there's all that that compounds it too and makes each situation unique. Right. That's there's, true. it's, you know, just from my experience as a nurse seeing how people who could, you know, look on paper, like similar case on paper, mm. when you see all these other factors play into it, they have completely different experiences, experiences. and outcomes. Yeah. And there's nothing you can really do to try to fix that. No. You know, there should be some kind of common ground. <laughs> yeah. You know, I guess we could all work for, especially when it comes to the financial piece. I know. It's and true. people being able to afford the care the care they need. Yeah. You know, that's I worked in a one nursing home, the first one I worked in, and it was in a very affluential area outside of Boston. Private pay. I mean the place was, was beautiful. It was one of the nicest places I ever worked. But they also had a very large uh, population of people who were there that were on Medicaid. So even though, you know, they couldn't afford to be there, they were there. Mm. And they got the same as everybody else, which mm. everybody deserves to have yeah. what they need, I regardless know. of financial, especially when they're so vulnerable. So vulnerable. Yeah. And I mean, to that point, this is not something that this is this is a disease it's nothing that to do, nothing they did right that gave them this it's nothing to be ashamed about and yeah yeah i wish that's the other thing i wish people would see it more like they see other diseases that it's a disease that this person has and they need special care um and they'll have different unique needs from one person to the next but yeah, don't whisper about it. Don't shun talking about it. Right. Break the <laughs> stigma and the silence. That's, That's right. That's our goal. Exactly. Before I let you go, can did you want to just say a few words about Al's authors and what that means to you? Sure. Um, I joined uh, the Al's authors team because I think you guys will get the message. <laughs> <laughs> I really like um, me, people are being able to share their experiences and learn from each other because I know that the things that I learned, I can want other people to know so that they can have a better experience. And all's authors is a place on the, on the web that you can go and find so many unique, um, experiences, but within those unique experiences, amazing, uh, guidelines and perspectives and ideas and activities and tools that can help you. And actually that just made me one more little point that I haven't even <laughs> mentioned. I have a second book that I did with a social worker um, who's in her job is a dementia care worker at a, at a care community in um, the Edmonton. So Western Canada, I'm in Eastern Canada and it's called I smile for grandpa. And it's a book that we did to help when uh, a grandfather figure has a dementia disease versus weeds and Anna's garden is for when a grandmother figure has Alzheimer's disease. And Jacqueline um, came to me and, um, and we decided to create this book together. So, and it's also on all's authors, but yeah. All's Authors has great intentions to help the world one book at a time, um, help everyone else who's on this journey so that it won't be quite as difficult for you. You can use all the information that other people have gathered to help you. That's a great way to put it, Catherine. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs>
<laughs> if I didn't know better, I'd think you were on the team. <laughs> okay, well, I want to thank you for giving us your time today. You're welcome, Marianne. And uh, we'll talk soon. Yes, we will. <laughs> All right. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thanks, bye. Thank you for listening to Untangling Alzheimer's and Dementia, an Alz Authors podcast. For more details on this episode, please see the show notes. For more info on Alz Authors, please visit allsauthors.com. While you're there, be sure to browse our online bookstore of more than 250 carefully vetted books on Alzheimer's and Dementia. You can also find us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Please email your thoughts on the podcast to allsauthors at gmail.com. Remember, you are not alone. One can sing a lonely song, but we chose to form a choir and create harmony. 